um, going to kick us off here. Thanks so much for joining, um, especially to our panelists. And oh, we don't have one of our panelists. Where'd he go? Mm -hmm. Jabali, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. Second screen. Gotcha. Okay. I started to share the screen and all of a sudden you disappeared. So I got concerned. Um, that's probably more on my end, my bad. Um, all right. So for everyone else, um, this is one of the first times we're doing a Zoom event. So clearly things are going to go maybe not so great. I apologize for that and um, hope you can bear with me. We are recording. So in case that matters for anyone with sharing their um, video, if you would like to go um, sort of dark on that one, uh, because we are recording, totally your choice. Um, just want to get that going up front. But anyway, so we're here to talk about rocking the virtual interview. Uh, when we first started putting this together, it was, well, we're UXPA DC, what are we here to provide for the membership and for the community at large? Um, and this seems like a very topical one to cover, which is interviewing and hiring and everything to do with that in the age of COVID and in a, in a virtual setting. So we have our lovely panelists here, um, which we'll introduce one by one. Um, I think they're already unmuted for the most part, but we'll um, introduce down the line. So uh, I'll just go. I did this in alphabetical order because I didn't actually ask you guys for input, sorry. Um, but Abby is the head of product at Savvy. He's the, oh, sorry, currently the head of product at Savvy uh, as a student lending startup base in DC. He had previously served as product manager at WEX and at Capital One. Um, before product manager life, he has had several other roles, including opening a series of the Capital One coffee shops. So thank you for my free Wi-Fi. You're welcome. Um, next on the line, we have Emily Ryan. Emily is passionate about creating the best user experience possibly can. She wants to create solutions, not just pretty websites, and believes creativity comes from collaboration anytime, anywhere, and with anyone. The more she knows about design, development, and IA, the better team player she can be. She is currently the VP of UX at Go Canvas. So welcome, yes. Emily. Thank you. Jabali, who I know is on, even if I can't see him on my screen, mm -hmm. uh, he brings over 20 years of experience across design, UX, marketing, and business development, um, currently at UGroup's digital experience team. He's responsible for ensuring the products and services developed are user-focused and in support of the client's strategic object objectives. Excuse me. So, hey there. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> and then finally, last but not least, we have Mauro Scappum. He's a multifaceted creative leader with nearly 20 years of recruitment, account management, and sales experience, specializing in all aspects of creative staffing for UX, digital, and print, with emphasis on workforce planning and strategy for Fortune 500 clients. Hey there. Hey, Asha, thank you. So between these for lovely individuals. We've got a uh, startup, we've got recruiting, we've got some like, touch of agency and some um, private industry. So hopefully we're gonna get a good cross section um, of everyone but government basically in DC, although I'm sure everyone has some dealings with clients or, um, or somebody to do with government. Um, I have to let more people in the waiting room, but for that, I'll go quickly over um, Nope. There we go. Some ground rules just to get started. Um, I'm sure we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point, maybe nauseatingly familiar, but they've got the reactions down there at the bottom. So use them as we talk. Um, it helps our, our panelists get a, read the room, if you will, in a way that, yeah, see, just like that, Abby, um, in a way that, you know, we normally would be able to do that in person. So it helps with some engagement. Um, if your camera's on, obviously we can do the grid view so we can see your faces and uh, respond appropriately. Um, use the chat for questions. Uh, we're monitoring those for questions. Um, or if you just want to like have a conversation, you know, up the points or maybe make another point, by all means, use the chat. Um, we're reading those. People have them up side by side. And I know when I'm a participant in these types of uh, things, it, it helps to feel as though there's conversation happening, even if it's not exactly the same as in person. Um, we've got some moderators looking out for the Q&A portion of this. So help them out. Put the big I know you can't bold, but like the big caps question for whomever it is, um, question for all, whatever it is, um, so that our moderators can pick it out easier and that we can get to them quicker when we get to the Q&A portion. Um, and as you are currently already doing, 
please stay on mute if you're not called upon to share. It just helps with the noise. Um, and I'll, you'll see me go on and off mute as well as we had our panelists to talk. So without further ado, I guess I will stop sharing because that's not, I'll keep this up actually, um, just because it's one of the many screens there. But just to kick us off, I want to go down the line and give uh, each of our panelists an opportunity to maybe introduce themselves a little bit differently than um, than I did, or expand upon it and talk about you know their perspective and their industry things that that matter specifically for what they're representing. So I will start alphabetically with you, Abby. Hey guys, Abby Agarwal. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm probably the least experienced like UX person on this panel, given I'm a product manager, not a uh, a designer. Um, we are currently looking to hire a UX designer, just a quick plug. So if uh, anyone else is interested, please check us out on AngelList um, for the posting. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about hiring designers, either at, uh, from the product perspective at least, um, either from big company life at Capital One and at Wax, um, or uh, at startup life, you know, 25 person company. So I'm happy to answer any questions on either end of the spectrum. Great, Emily? Uh, Emily Ryan, so I've got 23 years of experience, which is scary to say that because I mean, I've been out of college for a long time uh, and I'm getting old. Um, but anyway, lots of different backgrounds um, that I've been in. Uh, so I was a designer originally, I was a developer for years after that, uh, and then I transitioned into UX. Um, I've kind of worked the gamut from startup to government consulting to higher education um, and a lot of things in between. So. Um, I like working with people who have lots of different backgrounds or who may be looking to transition their um, career path um, because that's obviously what I've done a couple of times. Um, and so right now at Go Canvas, um, we are going to be looking at uh, building out our team a little bit more later this summer. So we are starting to get ready for that. Um, but I have been through um, the virtual interview process several times, uh, especially for jobs on the West Coast long before COVID came along. Um, so I'm going to tap into that a little bit this evening when I talk and just give some tips on uh, things that have worked and things that have not worked, as well as having hired people in that way. So um, a lot of experience with doing virtual hiring and interviewing. Glad to be here and great to meet you guys. Great. Jabal, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, my experience, again, 20 years of experience uh, and, and, a, and a lot pretty similar to Emily as far as I did 10 full years in architecture and then made a complete shift over into um, design, UX and dev. And it kind of, that was kind of the order it was under design, then developer and then UX um, because of kind of the time. But I also made the career transition during the recession. And so also kind of understanding what it's like to be in a position where you're looking for work. You have a certain number of years of experience, but you're also competing with people and varying levels of experience for every level of job. And so I've, I've kind of been through that process where I was, uh, looking to transition during what was otherwise a tough economic time um and so then from a matter of kind of type type of organizations working with government working with private sector all over the board i definitely have experience um in that way as well so just i'm a sponge or i'm here to provide any input that you can uh handle <laughs> yep uh this is my foster cat you'll see her tail make an appearance um He's very excited for computers for some reason. Anyway, if anyone wants to adopt a cat, uh, <laughs> uh, Mauro, <laughs> why don't you go ahead? Hi, I'm Mauro Scappa. I'm with Media Barn. Um, I too come with about 20 years of experience, uh, primarily focused in the recruitment space, but I started off uh, as a designer and developer and fell into recruitment um, and uh, was working for Aquint for about five years, uh, worked my up, way up from um, recruitment account management, sales, and then transitioned over to Media Barn. I've been there for 15 plus years. Uh, so, and, um, but yeah, no, so uh, obviously very heavily involved. We focus um, in UX. We're a unique digital consultancy. So I head up their placement services division. So I work with a lot of clients externally, but I also help hire for folks internally for Media Barn as well. So we kind of have a unique glance into not only our internal UX needs, but those of our clients externally as well runs the gamut across different industries. Um, and yeah, so uh, the virtual interview has been, uh, you know, gone hand in hand with my job lately and uh, happy to share any advice that we, or I can provide to everybody here today. Great, um, so let's just go ahead and get, uh, get into the first part of it, which is a nice segue for you, Mara, specifically um, being your main role being recruiting. Um, 
how should one go about searching for, for new opportunities, um, especially given some positions may be up but not really active or just navigating what, what it looks like exactly right now? Yeah, sure. Uh, happy to jump in on that. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, with COVID going on, uh, and that's probably why we're all um, here and interested in hearing about how people are dealing with it and managing it. Um, overall, I would say that not a whole lot has changed in way of how to go about, um, you know, applying and interviewing and things like that. Um, to your point, Asha, I mean, for sure, uh, things are taking a little bit longer. Um, the interview process might take a little longer to hear back from somebody. Um, we've seen that for sure. I mean, I've been working on Rex since April, um, and it's, it's a bit of a trickle down effect where, you know, their clients are waiting for their clients and uh, everyone's just trying to feel out the situation and seeing how um, things might play out. Um, my advice would be to keep at it, um, stay proactive, um, stay involved, um, you know, try to reach out to people on LinkedIn. Um, but overall, you know, stay on the job boards. The, the, those things haven't changed. LinkedIn, Indeed, Monster, uh, apply where you can. And, and I'm sure we'll jump into some of the specifics of uh, how to go about that later on. But um, overall, uh, keep at it. Things will, uh, are starting to pick up. We're already seeing uh, an upturn. So uh, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, I would, I would like to echo that too. Um, you know, especially if there's a company or a particular organization you want to work for. A lot of us right now are looking at Q3 and Q4 and looking at like finance and what we've got going on in the organization in terms of, you know, being able to pay salaries and things like that. So we're making plans to move forward, but to Morrow's point, it's taking just a little bit longer, but generally it's that notion of the minute I'm able to put the rec out and start hiring, I'm going to do it immediately. And so at that point, if you're already on my radar, because we already have a connection, um, then I'm probably going to, to let you in first. And, and also to that point, what I've seen is um, jobs are closing faster because they're getting so many people in when they open. Um, so you almost want to be kind of on top of that and really starting to, to, to be proactive about those types of roles. And if you know that something's going to open up, you know, go ahead and start communicating with that hiring manager because it's going to make a big difference once the, the kind of surge of resumes comes in the door. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And I would add um, that in, because of the nature of, of what we're going through, some companies are actually needing to hire even more. Yep. And so I'd say be very, uh, very, be very attentive to people that are posting new recs right now during this time, because um, as everyone is saying, they will go quickly in their situations where if, if you're working in a, uh, with a contract with a government organization that needs to staff up because of this, then, there, then, then there's pressure on us in order to hire even quicker than we would otherwise. And so it is kind of a follow your typical th um, pieces, be proactive, don't kind of get, get lax because it feels like the process is slowing. Just be patient, but remain proactive, but then also look for those situations where people are actually posting because in most cases, they're probably for a pretty immediate need. If for the, for the companies that are hiring right now, it's probably specifically in relation to COVID or supporting something that supports um, an affected industry um, in response to COVID. Great. Um, so as hiring managers and recruiters, uh, give, us, give us the inside info here. Cover letters, resumes, portfolios. What do you use it for? What do you care about more? What do you want to see on it? So if I can give my perspective on this, so we've been trying to hire for a UX designer for a little while now, and our posting has been on AngelList. Um, and honestly, one of the biggest difficulties I have is that people will send me like walls of text um, in their submission. Um, and it's really difficult to figure out like, you know, especially for me being a non-designer um, hiring manager, like it's really difficult for me to figure out like what I should be paying attention to. And given like the various time constraints we have, um, the people who I'm quickest to respond to are usually those who have the most succinct um, and uh, pointed responses to me. Um, like, I think you could use help with this and this, and here's the like experience that proves I can do these two things. Like, here's how to contact me. Let me know if you're interested. Um, and that may be like somewhat idiosyncratic to me, but I suspect that most hiring managers are going through some version of this, especially given the layoffs that have happened. Um, time is at a real premium right now. So keeping it shorter and pointing to your portfolio um, would be really helpful. Um, and to the extent that you are like putting your portfolio out there, um, if you include like the passwords to get um, 
beyond the initial screens, that's also really helpful because going through a second round of emails just to get the password is a little frustrating, um, just given the time constraints that we're all feeling right now. Yeah, it's it's funny because I looked at some of these questions beforehand. Every answer to one of my questions is going to be it depends. Um, and so instead, I'll actually respond based off of our environment. If you're working, if the company that's hiring you also has like an entire sort of staffing department, then the answer does change. For myself personally, as a hiring manager, I am minimally interested in, in, in resumes. It is a very quick skim and I'm kind of going to portfolio, but I'm also depending on the write up that I've gotten from the hiring from the uh, recruiter that's pretty much already done a decent job vetting them and giving me the basic overview of the candidate. And so for the cover letter and the resume, those things are not as important for me personally, but in order to get to me because the staffing um, manager had to, had to do some outreach in order to, to, to um, scan all the candidates, you have to have all that stuff formatted appropriately to be able to go through screen readers, to be able to catch somebody who's not technical, to be able to understand that you're capable of matching job jobs with, um, with what your skills are. And so you absolutely still need to put emphasis on in a lot of cases, it's really more for the initial screen and getting past that. But I think for me personally, at least, um, it's much more the work and the conversation that I'm, that I'm interested in. Yeah. yeah. I was, oh, go ahead. No. I was just going to say, I think um, there's a couple things. One, um, what I always tell people is have a text, pure text version of your resume that you can very quickly submit. Um, most government uh, agencies require, they use screen readers to go through to make sure that there's a keyword match. Um, and a lot of times creatives make these beautiful resumes. So I always say have a text version, have a, a beautiful version, the version that, you know, really uh, exemplifies who you are. Um, but that's really, uh, that's really to get in the door. And honestly, at the end of the day, it's all about portfolio. And if you, if you look at your portfolio as another project that you're putting together and you're putting the same level of effort into that portfolio that you are all the work in it, it shows because I've actually seen portfolios where the portfolio is literally, you know, a PDF with 30 screens of different apps that somebody has built with no context, no nothing and sent to me via Google drive. There are so many, so many sites out there right now that are free um, or very low cost. Um, a lot of them now allow you to really use tools that are already created for you to put together something. So spend the time and get that portfolio. It doesn't have, a, have to have a ton of work, but it should be something that exemplifies the work that you're putting in it. And so there should be a match between the quality of the work in the portfolio and then the portfolio itself. Because again, uh, to me, the resume and the portfolio are sort of, you know, they're just a glimpse inside of your, th your thought process and your design process. Um, and if they're not well thought out, um, then that can be a barrier to, to getting in front of a hiring manager. We got to piggyback off of uh, Jabali and Emily. I, I think that, you know, it, it does depend on industry and job type client that you're applying to. Some are a little bit more conservative. Others want to see more of the creative. Um, what I've seen recently, especially on the creative side and the UX side, is a kind of a combination of both where um, one candidate in particular just recently kind of, it's a custom portfolio, right? Or a custom resume that is really tailored towards that client. And I recommend people to do that for any rec that they're going after, really tailor your resume. Because to Emily's point, you know, if it's going through a VMS and they're looking for keywords and either you're going to this bucket or that bucket based on what you have on your resume, make sure that those keywords are at the top of the list and uh, make sure that you know, you're speaking their language, right? So they understand and they know that you have that type of experience that you're going after. But back to that candidate, you know, he had a really custom portfolio where he had a, almost like a cover lever built into the portfolio itself. So as the hiring manager went through the resume and the portfolio, they were able to see very specifically like, oh, this person gets exactly what I'm looking for. It's product-based, that's what I need. You know, they use these skills and these applications and that's what we use. And so it was two of my clients in particular were like, this guy's great, you know, I got to see him immediately, so. Cool, um, I would normally save this for the Q&A, but it's so particular, I'm just gonna say it now. Um, does the, for the text reader, um, how does Google Docs figure into to that type of screening? Or text version of the resume? Or like Google Suites in general, is that a platform that, um, makes it easier for you guys? Does that make it harder? From what I've seen for external VMSs, no, usually it's an uploaded type of document that you mm -hmm. need to physically upload into the system. So, you know, doc, 
PDF. Those typically tend to work okay. Obviously, more text heavy type of um, uh, resumes work a little bit better, but um, typically you can't, you know, uh, the, dot, the um, Google Drives don't translate as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've gotten them for jobs I've posted before where we've said, you know, here, put in the URL to your portfolio and they'll paste a Google Drive link. Um, and I've actually seen some, some uh, portfolios that have been created in this PDF format that are very nice and they actually have context to them. But I've also seen where people, like I said, will just take screenshots and glue them together into a document and email that um, out. And generally, um, it doesn't show as well as if you had actually spent a little bit of extra time creating sort of a, a small portfolio website uh, presence. And again, you know, it can be as simple as saying, here's my resume, um, here's a little bit about me, here's some of my selected works, and then here's a contact page. Like you can actually have an entire presence with, you know, four very simple screens. Um, and like I said, now the tools out there, are, there's so many different tools for creating really creative um, interesting ways to present your work um, and a lot of them are free so I would highly recommend you know, at least checking one of those out Wix and, and some of these other ones uh, do a great job with that and that way then um, you can also do some of what Moro's talking about which is really kind of tailoring that uh, to that experience of, of being able to invite the reader in and have them you know become part of that uh, design experience that you're presenting. Can I add one last thing to what Emily just said? So I totally agree with Emily. Like I've seen so many people who have had really interesting like triple sites or their own personal websites yeah. or uh, even posting a lot of this stuff on LinkedIn. But one challenge that I encounter personally is that I'll see a couple of candidates who've applied recently who have like five different links at the bottom of their um, their submission. So they'll have their LinkedIn page, a Medium page, a, Wic, um, a, a Dribble page, uh, their own website. Um, and it's like kind of overwhelming. Like, I'm not sure what I should be looking at. Um, and then plus with Dribbble being so um, um, photo heavy and text minimalist, it's really difficult to see like, what are they trying to point me to? Like that context is totally um, missing. Um, so like be a little bit more pointed, I think, at least for the, um, the design and experience hiring managers that are out there. And I think there's probably quite a few of them who are like, just like me in that same kind of boat um, who need like a little bit of handholding to understand what it is that you're trying to highlight. And I just, sorry, I forgot to say it, but uh, thank you for, to Nazine for the, pre uh, the question. Um, that secondary question there. Uh, all right, let's talk about um, when you guys are looking through, I say you guys, sorry, when you are all looking through um, like the stack of resumes or the endless you know, inbox of, of links, um, what helps a, a candidate or a potential, potential candidate, what helps them stand out? So, so for me, um, I think this is probably one of the most important things is that, as you said, the way that goes, it, it is literally a stack, whether it's we use uh, with the lever. And so I'm going through 15 people at a time. And so it's a comparison. It's not like, a, oh, I really like this individual and I see what they look like. A lot of it is they stood out in comparison to someone else. And so with that, it does become if I'm looking at the resume and it is in PDF and it's something I can actually tell as a design effort. I'm starting from there all the way through portfolio to get a sense of how you are basically branding yourself. What are the ways in which you presented yourself? Um, how clean is your resume? I think, I think oftentimes, uh, you know, resume is one of probably, I don't want to say the hardest design print design challenges there is, but considering you add the aspect of writing for yourself, designing for yourself and possibly too much text for a page and having to balance how what size the font needs to be like, it's actually a pretty decent design challenge. And so I do look for opportunity to look for that balance of, how did you over-design it and go a little too far to want to be creative versus sort of stick somewhat to the expected, easily readable um, format of a resume and then go into the portfolio looking for opportunities to see your portfolio, your personality and how you genuinely provided context around your work as opposed to just the quality of work. Because I've definitely seen product before, like where this is the work where I could say, Maybe that was a client decision. Maybe there was something challenging there. I might make a potential excuse for how this project looked the way it does if the person really presented it well, wrapped around it, and the rest of the portfolio was amazing as far as how the site was structured, organized, and especially the content was written. That is a definite plus up. If somebody can really write as a designer, it's, it tells me a lot about how much they, they think through all of the work that they do. Yeah, 100% agree. The, 
the work itself is good to see, um, but the way in which they present the work and the way in which that story is presented, I think a lot of creatives um, don't put enough effort and energy into the words that they put with their, their designs. Um, so when I'm looking, especially for UX, um, which is gonna be a little bit different than visual design, but when I'm looking for UX, I actually want to see what was the problem that was being solved, what was the goals, you know, how, um, how successful what was the uh, project. Uh, and then one of the things that I really emphasize and I, I can't overemphasize enough is to not take credit for work that you didn't do. And so a lot of people will say, well, but I was part of a team and that's great. That's what you need to put in there because I really wanna know what that team structure looked like, what your role was. Um, and a lot of people I think feel very reticent to do that. And what's great about putting that in there is it tells me you can actually work with other people and it tells me you can collaborate. So what I like to see is I like to see a balance between the, the visuals and the wireframes and the photos and the sketches as well as what the what you were doing because when i'm reading that i'm looking at that as a, basically an introduction or an understanding of the problem that you were trying to solve and that's what we do as ux professionals right we solve problems um so it may not be the most beautiful thing but if you are articulate and you can tell me what it was you were trying to do and whether or not you were successful and not every project has to even be successful um, sometimes it's actually interesting to put failures in your portfolio and i've actually read some that have been great um, and they've made great talking points during interviews. Um, those are the types of things that we really want to see, which is that that more well-rounded approach to UX and not just making stuff look pretty. Yeah, I, I totally agree as well. And uh, again, uh, with uh, Jabali as well, I think that finding that balance really, really, really helps. Um, you know, I kind of touched on this before of having those keywords, right? Having um, speaking their language, understanding the job description, don't just blanket apply. Um, words do matter, uh, responsibilities do matter. Um, so when you're composing your resume or compiling it together for a particular job, um, look at the job or the, the needs or the objectives that the client's looking for, right? Uh, figure out, okay, oh, actually I did that in this job. Let me pull that to the top, bubble things to the top because mm -hmm. As a recruiter, that eight second rule that they always talk about, uh, it's, it's somewhat true, you know, and um, getting your uh, foot in the door with somebody is, uh, can be, make, you know, make a really big difference in just having either one word or one sentence or one bullet um, just cleanly placed on your resume and that can make all the difference. So think about things like, you know, how to stand out. So typography, we touched on that, color, layout. Um, how are you gonna separate yourself from the other people without going too far and being like, oh, you know what they, what the Jabali, what the Jabali said, you know, they overdid it, you know, they, they don't, they're, you know, too much, and they move on. So uh, it is a really fine, a fine line, and it's balanced. Um, but run it past somebody, right? I mean, that, you always have your friends, your network. You know, how does this sound? How does this look? And then compare it to the job description. How do I match up to this job? You know, what else can I pull from my background and my experience to make me a better candidate? Um, give it some time before you just throw it over the fence. Um, all right, so our hypothetical person has submitted, they found you guys, or they found the right one, they've crafted the right uh, cover letter, resume, profile, everything, um, and now they're getting to the interview stage, which of course is, is virtual right now, um, for the most part. Um, what are some things that as you're doing virtual interviews or have done virtual interviews you've messed up or find distracting? Um, just the not to do's, the to do's. Uh, what, what should people know about the, the virtual interview itself? Oh, I got this one. <laughs> I've done so many of these. Um, and like I said, I've been doing these for years. Um, uh, four years ago when I was uh, out on the West Coast and looking for folks out there. Um, there's a couple of things that are really important. So one is um, you need to treat the virtual interview as if it's a real interview. And I've seen candidates do this where they've got iMessage and they've got their email and they've got their Slack and those things are popping up and you can watch their eyes go down and you can watch them type and you know in that moment they're not paying attention to you. So what I would say is don't silence those things, actually turn them off on your computer. So totally shut down webmail, iMessage, Slack, um, get in front of something that's going to be a very neutral background. If you look at all like five of us right now, we all have these very neutral backgrounds, which is wonderful um, because it says professionalism, it's clean, it's, there's not a lot going on back there. Um, virtual backgrounds are weird um, because they will eat you. Um, everybody's 
played with the virtual backgrounds and they're super fun when you're doing happy hour. Um, but your body parts will disappear into them, um, which can be really distracting. Um, so I would say find something in your house. It can even be a white wall. It doesn't really matter. Um, Make sure your light is hitting you from the front and not the back. You look like you're in the witness protection program when the light's behind you. <laughs> Everything is black. <laughs> We've probably seen some of this. Um, and then the other thing is to the extent that you can get rid of the distractions. So like, I know we're in this kind of interesting um, time right now where like real life has kind of merged with business life. And so people have their kids and they've got their pets and things like that. Um, and that's the reality of the situation, but if at all possible, if you need to go, go shut yourself in a bedroom um, and try and put away some of those things just for the moment. Because again, um, what I find is that those, those momentary distractions will derail a conversation. And if you're a candidate and you're very nervous, and especially if it's your first few times of doing it, um, they're really going to kind of catch you off guard. Um, so I would say, you know, ahead of time, ahead of the interview, set up your space, make sure you look good. Cause the cool thing with like zoom is you can look at yourself on your zoom. You can start your own zoom meeting and see what you look like. Um, but then, like I said, treat it as if you're actually in the interview room, right? You know, put away the phones, put away all that stuff and just focus in the moment, look at the camera, um, and just kind of go with it and, and realize that, you know, it, it is still, um, a human on the other side of the screen, but um, you know, just kind of uh, treat it as if it were something happening in real life. Those would be my uh, pieces of advice, having gone through this so many times. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think an easy rule of thumb for it is if we were in person, however you typically behave when you go to work, the percentage of which you elevate or clean up that behavior when you go to an interview, think about that the same way. And, and like, I'm absolutely in a place where Yes, I've had client meetings and pitch meetings where I'm showing up like, oh my gosh, people are going to be wearing a tie on this thing or any traditional way I would be doing that. But then, I, but then this guy has on a hat, he's outside, he has a beard, and it seems like everything <laughs> is casual these days. And so I definitely, I understand it and have a little bit of leeway for the fact that this is still a different reality. But I do think that is that there's an ex expectation that the reality should still um, professionalize itself the same percentage up that it would from your typical Zoom meeting when you're at your own office with your own work or with your friends, like you should still treat these, these things in that, um, that same difference. And I think another piece is um, continue to make eye contact with the screen and pay attention to the other person's reactions because something I've also seen when doing virtual interviews is a person starts to ramble a little bit longer because they actually haven't looked up um, and, and not, it's, it's already hard enough to read kind of uh, visual cues and sort of see how a person's reacting to what you're saying and whether or not you should continue going. But if you start kind of doing the wander, looking off and you let your nervousness get to you, then you might answer more questions and just keep going. And the person is kind of trying to get your attention politely. So, so really focus in on trying to still make it feel personal and then kind of find a percentage that makes sense to kind of up your, your preparation. Um, and professionalism for the interview that considers the reality of the times that we're in. Yeah, if I can add just like a couple of really quick things that I found. Um, so the distractions thing I totally agree with. One thing, like even just putting a clock behind the screen, so that way if you are, are in a time rush, like you don't need to look somewhere else. It's like a super small little thing, but it does feel nice. Um, I've also had like, you know, strangely, like um, because we're in these times, like interviews that I would have done on the phone, I'm now doing on video instead. Um, but some of the folks like, 15% or so are dialing into them uh, using like the Google Meets like phone number option as opposed to using their computer. Um, and that's like a, a downer in two ways. You know, one, like mm -hmm. I don't get to see you and read your facial expressions and that kind of stuff, which is, you know, partially a bummer. But the other reason is, again, like for me being an, 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 not a designer, right? So part of what I'm looking for is for you to walk me through part of your portfolio that's relevant to the things that I'm going to be asking you about. Like I see this portfolio. Can you show me like pieces of it? Um, and when I have those discussions, they're actually really vibrant and they lead to like really productive outcomes. Um, but you can't do that if you're on the phone versus when you're on like the actual Zoom or Google Meet or whatever. Um, so try, even if you're gonna turn your video off because you know, whatever kids are running around or whatever, um, try to actually be on the computer um, so you can share your screen uh, if that comes to that. Yeah, and uh, to piggyback on all of that, uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind too is, you know, what you look like on the other side. So your environment, what Emily touched on, um, you know, not to kind of 
jump into a horror story, but a few years back, we had um, an interview happen uh, where we were in the conference room. There's three of us on the other end. Uh, and this person was out of town um, and she was in a current poll. So she had to step out or find a place to have the interview, which is completely understandable. Uh, but she chose her car. And so, and which was, which could have worked, which could have been fine, but she was on her cell phone in the parking lot and was just scared of being caught. So she's constantly doing this and talking to you like you're on speakerphone. And it's, when you're on 70 inches on the other side, you know, you, you see the back seat and it's a messy back seat. It's so hard to, you know, forget that, right? And focus on the person that's in front of you because they're so distracted, right? And, and so just remembering where you are, um, Starbucks, things like that, there's, you know, there's distractions in the background. Obviously that doesn't come into play so much right now, but you know, it does when we get back to normal. Uh, um, what you're wearing. So I know somebody mentioned that in the chat, you know, attire. My, I'm a little bit more traditional. I, I would say, you know, better to be overdressed than underdressed. Uh, to Jabali's point, you don't know who you're going to be meeting with, but at the same time, you know, it's better to err on the side of caution when it comes to that. And um, yeah, so environment. Um, oh, oh, and the other thing that I wanted to touch on, sorry, was testing your technology ahead of time, right? So mm. know where you are, test it out. Is my Wi-Fi stable here? Do I need to move to the other side of the house? You know, uh, what else can I do in order to prepare for this? Don't just jump in on your phone or something else, expecting everything to go smoothly because, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that interruptions or things can happen real time, right? Uh, during the interview. And especially when you're at home, um, you know, to, you know, to talking about kids or pets or anything else. So check it out first, see what it's like, do a dry run, see what you're dealing with. Yeah, one more thing I want to add to, um, I've seen more people on meetings at standing walking or not standing desks, walking desks and bike desks. So if you have one, that's great. Don't use it during the interview because you see a lot of people doing this. Like I have a, one of the women on my team just got a new bike desk and I love it because she uses it all the time, but she's constantly doing this now in our meetings and in a meeting it's fine, but for an interview, it's a little discombobulating. So um, if you do have those devices, you may want to just pause them for, for the time that you're in the interview. That is amazing. I, I have to um, <laughs> have to add a quick piece about the uh, the, the the how to dress piece because um, this is kind of like a a personal soapbox. Because um, there's there is there's kind of this narrative, especially in the creative industry, where it's like overdressing makes you like like oh that's a suit. This person's not legit. Like you got to come with a certain designer look. I I have never in my entire career ever seen a legit designer judge because they were overdressed. Like maybe if you can't talk it, then you walk in overdressed and it's like, oh wow, this is actually the the wrong type of fit for us. But if you completely come dressed and you happen to be overdressed for the situation and people are more casual and you also know how to speak to what you're actually doing there, it is not gonna have a negative impact on it. Um, so that whole like, how do I get that right fit where I look creative, cool and like it's, Sure, but it's, I think don't overthink it because the reality is it's going to be a lot more about what you say unless you show up in a situation where you accidentally happen to be in front of a bunch of suits and then you're the one not and it, and it, it could have a negative impact on then how you perceive. Cool. And I know I'm not a panelist, but just something that uh, both actually multiple people said um, with like testing a bit in advance and make sure you know what you look like. Um, I've done some video interviews lately and to a great bit of like advice I got from somebody else was like whatever your setup is as part of your test. Um, I did like a dry run as Mara was talking about with a friend and then the friend took a photo of what I look like on their screen to send it back to, it was a makeup question, super girly, whatever, but I, I wanted to know if like the makeup was fine. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so she took a picture of it and like sent it to me on my phone so I could see that like I wasn't actually wearing too much makeup. The, the light does actually, you know, sort of flatten you out um, and that like I should wear red lip and not like what I normally would do. Anyway, so like side note <laughs> um, for the ladies out there or whoever wants to wear makeup, uh, you need to wear more on a video interview and I uh, seeing is believing and so get a friend to take a picture of you in your dry run because um, it really made a difference uh, and I like piled it on after that. Um, <laughs> oh, Zoom has a makeup filter? That's awesome, Sarah. <laughs> I need to know about that because I did not realize. Uh, that's awesome. Although I don't know if we were using Zoom. I think it was Google Hangout, but anyway, something else. Um, so we talked about obviously video interviews um, more common in the age of COVID, but what other, what other impacts to the interview process has COVID had 
in your experience or what your your companies or what you're seeing with uh, friends and and others in the in the industry. So so one thing for me is I don't think it's changed my approach too much beyond like just the technology stuff that we've talked about, um, but it has changed um, like what I expect in the answer. So given that we're all going to be working remotely, like I have questions about how are you going to do like research remotely? How are you going to source users when we're all remote? How are you going to conduct synthesis and workshops when we're all remote? Um, so like answers to those kind of questions are like how will you work with our dev team with all the developers being remote now too? Like how will you handle design specs? All those kind of questions are more germane to the, um, the topic. It's not that my interview approach has changed. It's that some of the, um, the answers that I'm looking for are a little bit different as well. Even going to like, you know, given that I'm at a tiny company now, like there's not a lot of UX people that we'll be working with together at the company. Like how will you get mentorship and coaching and personal like UX design coaching and um, development, um, given that you don't have people directly in the office with you every single day to help you in that, uh, on those dimensions. Yeah, I've seen uh, similar questions come from my client. That's, that's a great point. I think that um, one of the, I guess, the characteristics that I've been hearing or our clients asking for is being self-motivated, being passionate, driven, things like that, where, you know, maybe they were topical before, but now it's really, you know, you're at home and you're not being supervised and you're a new individual coming into our organization. How much handholding are you going to need and how self-reliant can you be? You know, how mature are you and how are you going to manage your time? Uh, and are you going to be successful at that? Um, it adds a whole other complexity and, and dynamic to uh, onboarding a new employee that um, I think hiring managers are being a little bit more uh, cognizant or aware of and are trying to sniff that out a little bit more once you kind of made it to that next level. Um, so it's certainly something that, you know, is worth mentioning once you get to that point. And maybe those are some of your key attributes that you could bring to the table or at least mention in an interview. Yeah, I think it's also important to figure out um, now that we have more companies moving to to be permanent remote um, to really ask yourself as a designer, as a practitioner, um, are you OK going to work for a company that's going to be remote permanently? Um, I do know in some cases, like for some folks, this, this time period has been fine and it's like, you know, I like this, but I really want to get back to an office. I'm one of those people who I actually like being in an office. I like being around people. Um, so when you start thinking about what that next job looks like, ask yourself if you really are okay with something that's full-time remote and then make sure that you have that conversation when you are interviewing, because what I'm hearing is some companies are saying, yeah, we're going to go to full-time remote after this because, you know, of all these changes, other companies are saying, no, we're going to have people come back as soon as humanly possible in the next like two months. Um, and then a lot of companies are somewhere in between. So make sure that when you are looking um, and you're having those conversations that you're also understanding what that expectation is going to be and to be honest with yourself as to whether or not that's going to work for you. A lot of times more junior folks do better when they are in a physical environment with other mentors. They may work better in a larger company where they've got other UX practitioners to help them. Um, so it really kind of depends upon where you're at in your career and sort of how you like to work. Um, and then to understand what the future of a particular company is going to look like in terms of what they're planning and what they're thinking. Um, because for some companies, big and small, this is going to be a very real future for them, which is completely moving away from office space. Um, and others are going to be, you know, go back to that very quickly and some are going to be somewhere in between. So also something to keep in mind. Yeah, I think something I've seen um, that's, that's kind of interesting is it, yes, this environment actually is requiring uh, more client maturity and more sort of um, mm -hmm. person, interpersonal skills maturity than, 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 than the in-person would. And it might seem like that would be backwards. But even with the interview process, when we talk about etiquette and how you present from a camera ready sample and how you prepare, the reality is all of your work is going to do is going to be like that. And so if I was interviewing somebody in person and I knew they're junior, they're never going to be expected to be in front of a client or I'm not going to put them in certain situations that can be sort of more of a reality previously. But right now it's kind of like, whether it's team meetings or it's something that kind of have to be in this exact example that I'm seeing. And so looking for opportunities, recognizing that the interview is, is, is sort of much more of a mock. Um, you're seeing, we're, we're kind of reading certain characteristics and, and just sort of how you approach it that might mimic the way in which your day-to-day -day work would look like because you kind of have access to more things now 
than you might have otherwise had you kind of been um, shielded by the physical going off to client sites into certain meetings. Um, another thing that's kind of come up because of the age we're in, um, there's a lot of layoffs or a lot of, um, you know, job insecurity. And so maybe more than typical, or at least more than in recent years, um, there's been folks who are out of work. Um, so those of us, um, full disclosure, I've been that, but, but like, full dis for those of us who are there, um, how much, uh, during this like stay at home or away from work time, should we be focused or care at all about like activities or learning development outside of work? Like using the time that you would be doing work to, I don't know, boost skills or end up with a certification of some kind. Like how important in the hiring process or in consideration is it of what people did with the time that they were not at work? Um, you know, for me, I would say it's, it's pretty important. I think, you know, don't, both from a personal and professional standpoint, I mean, personally, I, I would say learn a new skill, you know, take the time that you would otherwise have, you know, commuting to work or, you know, working to learn something new, hone in new skills. Uh, there's plenty of online uh, courses you can take. I mean, just even lynda.com, right? Uh, certifications, obviously, is a huge, it would be a huge advantage as well. But not only that, just stay active, active in the community, stay engaged, uh, stay in front of people. I mean, if your goal is to ch jump back in there and find something as quickly as possible, um, don't get lackadaisical about it. I mean, stay, stay with it and uh, continue. And it could be, you know, a couple of months before you do find something. So, you know, take that time in order to kind of stay on par with the competition, um, learn a new application, um, finish that portfolio. I know everyone has a tough time with, right? Uh, tweak that resume, uh, get it to where you really want it. Use that time to your advantage while you have it. Um, obviously, take time to decompress too, but that's always important to get your mind right into that place where you're, you're ready to jump back out there. Um, but yeah, don't, don't let that uh, valuable time slip by. So, so one, one like slightly dissenting opinion, uh, slightly narrow, um, is I, I know this time is like really, really difficult for everybody. I was talking with my mentor yesterday and we were both kind of joking that we're probably 80% as energetic as we are on a normal basis. And we're probably 80% as efficient as we are on a normal basis too. So like we're running at like two thirds efficiency um, comparatively to a normal environment. Um, so like for me, I totally get if there's someone who's been laid off or whatever, and has just been like exhausted by just applying for jobs alone. Um, like if you're doing this because you think it's for your own betterment and you think it's going to help you out long term, then that's great. Like go for it. Um, but I'm not looking for like validation that you were still putting in 40 hours a week, um, like while you were laid off um, or like anything like that. Um, so like, I think it's really just for your own personal growth. If this is like on your personal career journey, then great. Um, but otherwise, like it doesn't make much of a difference to me. I echo that exactly. Um, I, I tell my team that right now I don't expect perfection at all. 80% um, um, is probably okay. Um, for the most part, because this is a really tough time and I'd rather have people who are refreshed and who want to continue to work for me than a high performer who's going to burn themselves out, which is really easy to happen right now. Um, I do think it's important to keep up skills provided they're skills that you want to be keeping up. So if it's something that you want to learn because you've never had an opportunity and now suddenly you have um, a couple of hours extra a week um, because you're not commuting and you are really interested in that, um, that's great. Um, I also do think this is the perfect time to be exploring what does a good resume and portfolio look like and, and work on those. Um, because honestly, at the end of the day, you know, we want, we want folks coming to teams that want to be there, that have the skills that we need, um, that are still excited about the job. And right now it's really tough to, to get into that mindset. So I always say, do what you need to do. And if it comes down to playing an extra, you know, round of two dots versus learning something, you know, uh, do what you need to do in that moment. <laughs> Sometimes the two dots is very necessary. Um, but I do think it's also time to be realistic with yourself and to forgive yourself and to let 
it be okay that you're not performing at 100% because I don't know really of anybody that's able to do that and stay sane in this time. Um, and obviously mental health and emotional health is, is more important than just about anything else. So, um, so I would completely echo 100% what you said, Abby. And I'm baking some mean bread these days. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. The, the baking skills have gone through the roof. <laughs> well, those are going back to an office, man. Those like potlucks are getting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> um, uh, we've got. Um... Sorry, awkward typing. That was the cat feeder. Um... Anyway, talk about not having distractions. I'm in the worst case scenario right now. Um, we've got some recent grads and some career changers. I've seen some comments in the in the chat go by. So, what are some tips that you guys have for um, either of those groups, right? People who are coming right out of school or right out of boot camps, um, people who are changing careers, who may not have a full set of, you know, a very robust portfolio, or um, don't feel that they have a whole lot to, to put down on some of these. Um, sort of skills or experience-based questions? So um, I'll take that one. Like when I first switched careers, it took a, I don't know if it was a couple of interviews or even maybe my second job application for me to even learn how to, how to really smoothly integrate my architecture experience into my work to make it seem like I had 12 years of experience instead of two. Um, and I wasn't coming back out of a new school or a program. Um, and, and so I, I practiced and I sort of saw how people reacted to the things that I was saying to figure out what are the actual skills and traits I pulled from this that would make a really compelling story when I explain to someone this is who I am and why I do what I do and the way that I do it. And so I would say if you're changing careers, don't sort of say, oh, well, you know, I used to be a firefighter. No, what about being a firefighter? You work only under pressure. You work well with others. You consider uh, there's high risk and, and the need to have to be perfect, uh, to, to be perfect at times and to make sure that you follow certain rules like how can you take any career and recognize that what you got out of that absolutely gave you personal and professional skills that are going to come to what you're doing next? And so literally take the time to figure that part out. And I would say for like for recent grads, um, even if it's kind of coming out of undergrad, uh, just and, and in both really is also kind of be um, be be intentional around what you expect and I guess more realistic about what your first job is really supposed to provide you. I think I've seen folks that kind of do the, you know, I want to work for this this amazing agency. I want to go work for Google when I get out of this program. And it's like, you kind of want to just work and get a sense of what this stuff feels like, what the pressure, what the timeline, what the turnaround, what it really is to do the job. Because anybody that's ever been to any schooling and then done any job, it is not the same thing. And so getting an opportunity to get your foot in the door and actually have a chance to do the real work under a real mentor with the real pressure, with the addition of a real client and a real timeline is a pretty big win, even if it means you might have to sacrifice some things around salary or company type or whatever the case may be, recognize the value and absolutely um, getting into a place and getting that first year of experience. Yeah, I had a, um, a great candidate last fall um, who worked at Starbucks. Um, she was a UX designer and she um, wanted to build her portfolio. And one of the things that she did was they have an internal employee app that they use at Starbucks that helps them trade shifts. Um, and the app was not very well done. And so she actually redid the app in her free time and used that in her portfolio as a, as a project. And it was fantastic because, you know, she was able to articulate why it didn't work, why she had problems with it. She showed screenshots of the original app and then screenshots of what she would do with it. And so I thought it was a really creative, unique way to take something that she knew and understood very well um, and be able to apply a new skill set to it. Um, so from my perspective, and, and it, was, it was a mid-level position, uh, we brought her in and interviewed her and it was because she had put enough thought process into that particular project um, and I think she only had like one or two other ones in her portfolio, but it was really cool just to see that kind of approach to like, here's a thing that I don't like that I have to use and here's what I would do differently and here's why. So sometimes you can find those really interesting opportunities to do something similar to that, especially if you are, you know, in your first year, you're looking for that first job. Um, it's more about how you solve that problem and less about were you able to get a real legitimate project. Um, so I thought that was fantastic and it was really kind of a nice way to showcase her talents. 
Emily, was that a real project that implemented into production or was that like an Envision prototype? No, she had done the Envision prototype, but she actually had the real employee app. So That's she really did cool, a bunch though. of screenshots. She did sketches. Um, she even got together with her um, coworkers and they did like a whiteboarding exercise and a card sorting on it. It was so well done um, that That's that right. was the project that I actually brought her in for. And, you know, for her, it was just something that she did because she really felt um, she really didn't like the Starbucks app. Um, and so I said, did you actually send this back to home office? And she said, no, I never even thought about submitting it to them. But it was just really cool that she went through all the processes and all the steps to get to that. Um, and then she did turn it into a set of screens and, and, you know, walked me through it and had final visual design and polish on it. So it was really cool. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, and this kind of goes back to the last question, being able to tell a story, right. Um, being able to present something like that, that's emotional with someone's life. Like I had to change this because it wasn't working for me and I know I can do it better. And here's how I approached it. Um, it, it really makes an impact. You can tell that that passion behind it. Right. And, it, and when hiring managers see that, I think that it, it can certainly uh, make a difference between the candidates. So um, taking that time, you know, going back to the question before, you know, there are plenty of, uh, tools online like UX daily and things like that, where yeah. they'll present you with these UX challenges on a daily basis, you know, do it well, take time to do it, perfect your, that craft, um, I think makes all the difference. So, um, you know, even if it's not real, even if it's not online, even if it's not in production, you know, just having those things that you can talk through to really talk about the challenge, the steps you took, and then the results you were looking to see out of it is, uh, is important. Just to put a, like, three star stamp on how much I agree with that is yeah I've seen people I've actually I've often been more excited by the products that people did just on the side and they actually like got all their friends together and made them the usability <laughs> testing and stuff where it was like there's no there's nothing that made these people agree to participate in what you were doing but you went all out on it and you talked to 10 people you called people's parents and made them sit down and do interviews that's 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 so impressive to me when folks go to that level that length yeah in order to just solve a problem they were annoyed by or saw something, come up, create something fun or figure out a way to make a dating app better. But it was literally for, for no school, for no um, company that shows so much to me. And in that, like the, the students may have the edge on, a, on everyone else and that they have the, the time and maybe are annoyed by things that they can dedicate that to. So just because you're a student doesn't mean you don't have advantages there. Um, all right, sort of skipping from like all to nothing, I guess. A um, couple more points, and I swear we're gonna get to the, there's a lot of really good questions. Um, so when, when someone's gonna get to the negotiation stage of the interview process, right? Um, what words of wisdom or maybe inspiration can you guys as, as hiring managers um, sort of unlock to those who aren't as comfortable negotiating um, the the best package for them for themselves especially in this time like if you've been laid off or if you are coming out from school or career changing whatever it is um you may not feel that you have the wherewithal to advocate for yourself in the way you normally would so un unleash those shackles from us please <laughs> so so a couple things um i, I think it's going to be a little bit different when you're interviewing at like tiny company versus at like megacorp because um, I think the person you're interviewing, you're negotiating with is going to be a little bit different in both cases, and the budgets are obviously going to be way really different as well. Um, but from my perspective, like my advice is going to be like kind of easy for me to say, but like harder for people in reality. Um, like it's a multi-objective decision for people, and so I know people have like family obligations and so on, which may put additional pressure for cash flow. But in general, I don't think you should be like timid about saying what you think you deserve. Um, and if the hiring manager is going to squeeze you because uh, it's a buyer's market right now, or there's a perception of that. Like you're unlikely to have a really like great experience in that role anyway. Um, so I, I like you know worst case scenario that like I'm putting in you know, ten hours and trying to interview somebody, um, and so if I like you enough to make an offer, um, I don't want to lose you over like a couple thousand dollars. Um, so like you may want to like just get a sense of the boundaries on it early on in the interview process so you don't waste time. Um, but I would say like, don't be timid about asking for what you want. You can always choose to like accept or reject the offer because it doesn't meet your needs. Um, but, uh, I would say go for it. 
I agree 100% as well. I mean, I think um, obviously there's going to be fewer opportunities out there, but if you're at that stage where you're getting an offer, they obviously want you. Um, so that shouldn't change. You shouldn't devalue yourself just because of the conditions. What you're bringing is still what you'd be bringing otherwise. Um, so I, I completely, completely agree with that 100%. You know, if push comes to shove, though, and you're feeling like I really need this right now, I, you know, I can't mess around, you need to have a figure in your mind, right? Like, you know, what can I not go beneath in order to either make ends meet or what have you, right? Um, and, and if it goes below that, then you've got a tough decision to make. But uh, at the end of the day, at least you have something in your mind where you're like, I, I need to walk away and, and, and stick to it because um, in our industry right now in UX, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's pretty resilient one. It's, it's gonna continue on an uptick um, and it may not be this one uh, client uh, that you're gonna perhaps join, but there will be another one around the corner. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, to Abby's point, uh, it just wasn't the right client for you. They, they obviously didn't value what you're gonna be able to bring. So stick with that number. Yeah, and make sure that you have done a little bit of your homework. I mean, there are so many career guides and salary guides out there right now. Um, you can go to Glassdoor and see what um, what different companies of different sizes in this particular market are paying. Um, so that's the other side of this, which is you know know what's know what those acceptable bands are and what's reasonable, um, and then understand that the other thing that I would highly recommend when you are negotiating your salary. One of the things that people do, especially more junior folks, is they'll say, well, I need this amount or I want this amount. Your goal should be to talk about the value you bring to the business. So if you can say, and, and this is also what I tell people when they're going up for promotion and for pay raises after they've already joined an organization, which is know what your value is to an organization and be able to work that into your conversation. Because at the end of the day, if you need a particular salary because you've got, you know, a large family to feed or things like that, um, that's not going to resonate nearly as much as saying, this is the value that I bring you as a business and this is what you're going to get in hiring me. Um, so it's always about turning around that conversation when it comes to money and making it about how the business benefits from paying you that salary. So um, always try and keep that in mind. It can sometimes be a little bit hard, especially if there's, you know, personal um, issues and things like that, or you're really stretched for that, for that particular position. Um, but just remember that that's how, you know, businesses think about um, employees in some cases, which is, you know, what, it, what is the value that this employee is going to bring to my organization? So always remembering to keep that as part of your conversation is going to help you there too. Yeah. yeah I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jamali. Sorry, I, I agree with everybody's approach. I think just sort of from a mentality standpoint, something that's important to kind of re or recognize is like for any of us who have who've gotten a lot of experience and are more comfortable doing it now, it was just comfort. Like the actual fear of how's the person yep. gonna respond or is this gonna risk my job? That was never real. The only difference was I got more comfortable actually saying mm -hmm. the things. And for me, one easy piece of good advice is I worked with recruiters at, a, at right around that transitional point when I was going from kind of architecture into um, into design and so I could talk to that person and demand everything and they would have to go fight for me to get it and so it, it made me realize that the the company I was responding to was not like negatively or at least I didn't hear it, but I didn't get threatened to say no we can't do this I stood pretty strongly to what I I felt like I was worth and then could have that negotiation without the discomfort of, being, of having to do it and think that maybe this person is losing interest but as I got you know, more experience, I recognize that fear is not really real. Like when we go to negotiate with the people, we, we will have a salary of 75 and the person's asked for 70. We're going to offer them 72 to make them because we really want them. No one can go up to 75. We need room to negotiate. Like people are putting thought into the ways in which you go about even making first offers that consider the fact that you're probably going to negotiate back. And so if it's a decent company um, and someone that you probably would want to work for and it has, it has, especially if they have an actual staffing team and everyone who was putting it, who has this kind of experience in, in doing this process, then they've probably already even considered that in the offer that they made you. And so there should not be a discomfort. You should just do whatever you can to look for different tactics, but we wouldn't feel uncomfortable with whether or not it's going to um, <clears throat> impact your ability to get the, get to get the job. Very cool. I hope that gives people some uh, encouragement. Um, just sort of come to the close and then we'll open questions. Um, what about freelancing? That's something that I, that is 
bit more common in the UX and the design field in general than in maybe some others. Um, when would you opt for a freelancer versus a, like a W2 employee? Um, and there's anything that you're looking for different in the materials when you're considering a freelancer versus employee? So one thing I would say um, is kind of understanding the, the, the difference, at least for our company, of that word freelancer is, um, you know, sign up or become a part of some other company, whether it's Robert Half, Creative Circle, Top to whoever else, because the likelihood that I'm going to go find like an individual independent contractor versus go through a recruiter, it's more that we would use a staffing agency before rather than do a full hire if we can't if it's a shorter term project or we can't at this time vouch for um, holding an entire, bringing a new person in because of the um, projected work for the year that we can't hold their salary for more than six months, that would be the time in which we would use, um, we would bring in basically quote unquote freelancer, but it would really be a matter of us using a staffing agency or a recruiting firm or something like that, as opposed to kind of reaching out to an, an independent, um, freelance market. So I would say look for opportunities to kind of put yourself on list or, on, or partner with folks who do uh, place people on short term um, contracts. I mean, traditionally, what I found too, is that specialized skill sets are typically, you know, more freelance, no, not always, obviously, but I mean, the way that we utilize them internally anyways, is you know, if we have a product that we're looking to get out the door and we need an iOS developer, but, you know, we don't specialize in iOS development, uh, we can only get it to so far and we need somebody to be able to do X, Y, and Z uh, in a native app, you know, we're going to be able to, we're going to look to call somebody in, uh, to Jabali's point, you know, we'd call somebody up and uh, try to get them in there. Um, but from a corporate setting, I find that for the most part, it's based on how budgets are allocated, right? Where the company is, you know, are they looking for funding? Are they looking, you know, where the, the, the buckets of money really are sitting? So oftentimes you have clients that are uh, predominantly hire more freelancers than they do headcount because headcount, you know, brings down their bottom line. But um, so it depends on where the client is, what they're looking for, how they work. Um, you know, sometimes it's for, you know, leave, uh, you know, when an employee is out for a while, they need a freelancer to kind of get them over a hump. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a multitude of different types of reasons why people bring in freelancers. Um, but based on what kind of where you are and what you're looking to get into and what you're looking for, um, you know, I would position yourself some, you know, to, to, to do one or the other um, and go after what best suits your needs. All right, cool. Um, so I'm going to do is call out our moderator, Jordan. Thank you very much, Jordan, has been pulling the questions as you guys have been asking them in the chat. Um, so not necessarily going to go in order in which they were received, but um, we're going to try and get through as many of these as we can. So I'm doing a bit of a combo from Christina Ham and Sarah Duke, um, your questions. So what, um, like UX, exercises and and what kind of tools, um, especially for people who are first time using. So the example being like whiteboard, virtual whiteboard tools um, and familiar are using that, people who were not familiar using that in this virtual hiring stage or UX exercises in general that typically would be on a whiteboard um, in a normal one. How, how do you see that working in a virtual setting and any advice for people who are using those for the first time? I would say practice with them. Um, I know Zoom has its own virtual whiteboard, which is what we use a lot at work. Um, and it's literally right there in the screen. So um, you can pass uh, that presenter marker back and forth. Um, but I would say just try them out with, with either friends or family um, so that you start to get comfortable with them. Um, because generally, like you're probably gonna be asked to do some whiteboarding exercises during these interviews. Um, and so to be able to feel comfortable with the tools themselves, you may find that you need to use a stylus or a mouse or something like that, um, rather than a trackpad in order to, to do a better job with the whiteboarding. It's kind of like if you haven't written on a wall, <laughs> it can be very clumsy, like my handwriting is terrible on a wall, but I don't do it very often. Um, so I would say to the extent that you can get a few of those tools um, or the ones that are in the product themselves and just practice with them um, so that you feel comfortable with them um, is probably the best thing to do as with with any tool is, is practice makes perfect. 
and I, I think just to elaborate on that a little bit, um, kind of to Asha's point when she talked about like how do you actually perform your own usability testing to figure out what you look like on camera is have some is you want to see it from the other person's side. And so you want to a kind of get used to and comfortable with the with the software, but then also see what see what there's a lag like I've, what I've often done even yeah. in meetings in real time is we'll log in as both myself and then kind of as a second uh, email account. So I can see whether there's a there's a delay in when I write and when this shows up on the screen so that if I am presenting something, I'm not talking too far ahead of what the, when the other person is um, hearing it because it might not be there shouldn't be a delay in audio, but there will be in in whiteboard. So look for opportunities to not only get comfortable with the software, but then also to see how you can get a chance to notice what you look like and what what your um you know how you're using the software is actually looking like to the other person that you'll be working with. Yeah, and I would agree. I would say, and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, so if you know that that's coming, find out what they're using, how you'll be using it. Uh, and Emily's point, you know, get a stylus if you need it. I mean, obviously, we're working with a stylus rather than a mouse, you know, on your dining room table or wherever else you are. It might be easier to do. But don't be afraid to ask questions before you get into it. I think it's per perfectly reasonable. Yeah, and I've literally had candidates, actually, this is a few years ago, um, have their sketch pad in front of them and sketch things out and then turn the sketch pad around and put it up to the screen. Um, very old school, but if that's how candidates feel comfortable, I'm fine with that. And, and obviously when you're talking about creative field, people still use pen and paper. Um, so a lot of it is asking the questions of, you know, is this okay to approach it this way? This is how I like to work best. Let me show you what I'm thinking. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable with the tool, but you do feel comfortable doing something else similar to that, um, you may want to at least ask if that's okay to, to use that route um, when you're doing that type of interview or that type of interaction. That's very cool. Um, this one I'm going to read almost verbatim because there's a lot of good stuff in here. So this is from, uh, actually also from Sarah Duke, um, for everybody. So with permanent remote or remote in the meantime, how does a candidate ask hiring managers about their support or understanding for working parents? COVID-19 has seriously impacted women in tech, especially working moms. And companies are really showing their true colors as to whether they really are family friendly. How can this question be broached without getting into legal issues, uh, family status that can affect hiring bias? Go to Glassdoor. Glassdoor has a lot of that. Glassdoor has a whole separate category for parents and, and uh, benefits and culture. Um, I'm a big fan of at least reading Glassdoor reviews to understand what other people have said. Obviously, if you um, know folks, you can use opportunities like what we have here uh, to network. Um, I'm a part of several different women's groups where people will ask those types of questions. Hey, does anybody work at so-and-so? Can you give me an insight into this? Um, this is really where you put on your detective hat and you start asking questions of your community and your um, online community. Um, obviously, I would say have that conversation with um, HR as well too. But generally, um, most companies that are, that are smart um, are going to tell you all the great things. And if you really want to get to the heart of the matter, you probably need to do a little bit of digging around um, and just find out um, anecdotes and stories from other folks um, who've worked for those organizations. But like I said, Glassdoor generally has a lot of information about that, um, as well as some of the other uh, job sites where you can start to read what people will say about different organizations when it comes to benefits, um, parental leave, that type of stuff. Culture, culture is a big one. Um, a lot of that tends to pop up on some of these sites like Glassdoor. Yeah, so one other thought on that. So I think Glassdoor is a great place, especially for like the, the bigger corporations. Um, they'll have a lot more information about uh, their culture online. Um, but you should also think about reaching out to folks who may work at these companies mm -hmm. at, on LinkedIn to just to get a sense of like asking what their experience has been or like yeah. what their manager has done and so on. Um, I've had some managers, like when I, when I was at Wax, um, and we were starting to go through this, who were not particularly forgiving of, um, especially women who had like a disproportionate childcare responsibilities, um, having to like work odd hours, um, and others who were like super, super, super welcoming of that. But like as a hiring manager, this is a, a really difficult thing for me to talk about in an interview because I can't ask the question or like even proffer the information because it could be um, uh, like a, you know, a sign of hiring bias, as you pointed out, Sarah. Um, so I think Emily's suggestion about like trying to get probate questions about culture, you can also ask questions about like, hey, if this lingers longer, or if I have extra, you know, parental responsibilities to take care of, like my parents or something like that, just kind of broaching at the 
topic without talking about kids. Um, how would you guys handle like if I need to work from home for longer? I think these are reasonable questions to ask. And they're actually, when I made the switch from Wex to Savvy, this is a question I asked of one of the co-founders as well. Um, so I, I think those are really important questions to ask, but um, take advantage of LinkedIn, especially for the bigger companies and find people who are gonna be adjacent to where you're looking to land to get us into the hiring, um, to get us into the culture. Yeah, and I just want to, sorry, go sorry, ahead, go ahead Maura. <laughs> We're gonna both do this, okay. I got... <laughs> um, no, I was gonna say the same thing. Uh, I like that, that I've had multiple people ask me like, what's the culture like there? Or how do you feel work? I think a general question of during this time, how much do you feel supported? That doesn't talk about what I'm asking about specifically. That doesn't, that doesn't necessarily put you in a, a position to necessarily have to answer that specific um, area. And so it's really more, um, how can you frame the question that might at least get to the heart of it? And then absolutely the who you're asking. Like if it's an HR person or something or hiring manager that's clearly in that um, in, the, in position to know how to answer that question appropriately from a legal standpoint, then you can, I feel like you can ask away. But if it's um, otherwise, like we've been doing a lot of interviews, we've been doing two people at a time and sending folks through various levels of like having a practitioner who would be at your same level interview you and then have a, a director and they, like they're going through a lot of rounds back to back. So if, if I'm on the phone with somebody that's gonna be my peer, I would be a little bit more comfortable than asking that person what their experience is like been, what, is their, what has your experience been like through this time while working at the company? Like something that kind of keeps it vague, but is gonna sort of, could speak to culture and what's it like to work there? And how much do you like your job? Like those are questions I've gotten multiple times in interviews. Yeah, you summed it up perfectly there. And and don't be afraid to ask questions, right? I mean, I think people sometimes feel like, you know, it's, it's not appropriate or it's not the right time. Um, you'll know when it's the right time, but like when you get to that point and asking the right person and asking the right way, but ask, it's important. And it's a two-way street. Um, you know, you have to feel just as comfortable accepting the job as they have, they do offering it to you. So uh, if they're at a point where they're offering it and you're feeling like you may accept it, you, and those are important things in, in your life, then you need to check that box off. Don't be afraid to ask um, and feel comfortable with the response before you accept. Yeah, I like the tough questions too. I like um, things like, um, what would you change about the organization? What do you think the organization could improve on? Um, and again, if as a hiring manager, I like those questions because it allows me to have that conversation to say, these are the things where I think we could do better. And by the way, I'd like to have you on board with that journey um, because a good hiring manager is gonna be honest with you um, and let you know some of those things. So your questions when you are going through that interview process should not be sugar-coated questions. They should also be very real questions um, because again, think about it as a long-term thing. And, and especially if it's something that's weighing on your mind or you know, if you happen to have, have read um, different reviews or things like that, you know, feel free to ask, you know, kind of where they're thinking and, and how they're, how they're handling some of those things. I mean, I've had people ask questions like at a certain point we had a downturn in our glass door reviews and it was because we got acquired um, by a private equity firm and there were folks in the organization that did not like when that happened. Um, so I had several people ask during the interview process, like, oh, I noticed like, you know, employees aren't super happy about this particular thing. How are you perceiving it? Or, or what do you think of the acquisition? And so it allowed me to have that conversation. Um, and it also allowed me to know that they'd done their homework and that they cared enough about the position to ask those tough questions. So I would say if you get an opportunity to ask those hard questions, do it. Um, because if, if they shirk away from them or they don't want to answer them, then that's going to be a little bit of a red flag to you. And obviously, you know, um, everybody can make their own decisions, but, um, it is good sometimes to ask the tough questions of the interviewer because they're going to be asking you tough questions too. Very good advice. Uh, somewhat related to this on a slightly different topic. Um, do you find accessibility related knowledge or experience to draw more attention lately? Um, and does it give you sort of like a competitive advantage as a candidate. And this is from Anna. So, so I haven't, go ahead. No, no, sorry, Jamal, I interrupted you, go ahead. <laughs> Who knows? Um, <laughs> for, for me, um, it's been really uh, contract related. And so I haven't seen a spike because of the circumstances. It's more, um, we happen to already have contracts with organizations where it's a requirement to become uh, 
500 compliant certified. So if somebody had that already, it would be beneficial. And so I think the trend is going that direction, especially with larger government contracts where um, people are asking for um, 508 testers and, and accessibility testers and things like that. But that's been, that was that, that sort of um, <clears throat> came before COVID. But so that's, so I haven't seen a specific spike where it, where it seems like it's beneficial, uh, but it's kind of already been a trend where it's getting written more in the contracts uh, as a requirement for anybody that we place on some of the contracts that we work on. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a really, um, like we went through the project of upgrading our accessibility on all of our, um, our UI and UX, uh, and it was a huge mess to have to retrofit our existing um, uh, UX to accommodate for this. Um, and I wish we had been a lot more thoughtful about it at the front, like it would have been really helpful. So knowing that um, could both serve as like an example, like Emily, you were describing with um, some of those projects you were describing earlier, um, but also it's a pretty useful skill to at least know that we can count on that as opposed to having to rely upon a, a third vendor to do this, a third party vendor to do this. Yeah, it is icing on the cake if you have an accessibility background, um, in my opinion. Um, it's something that's always going to be needed. I think actually, as we start to come out of COVID, we probably are going to have a greater need for it in some cases. Um, and some of the things that we've started looking at is how can we do accessibility user research. Um, so being able to tap into some of that through different avenues as well as um, not just design, but also in how we think about research. Um, so for me, if you have that background, that is absolutely something that's worth highlighting on, on your resume and in your portfolio. Um, there's a couple of questions about like putting more like specifically putting together or breaking down projects for things like um, portfolios or resumes. So as an example, I'm going to go with Mark C's version of it. Um, typically work for organizations that uh, design and evaluate products and software for both internal and external clients. For candidates without experience, would you recommend breaking down your responsibilities and deliverable by project, i.e. multiple lists? or generalize them into single lists? Hmm. I'm gonna start calling on y'all if you don't unmute. Okay. I, think that, I think that goes with, it depends. Um, it depends upon how you're presenting the information um, and how you're talking about, um, how you're talking about those projects because I don't think there's any one right way to break that down. Um, it's just more about how you organize the information in your portfolio and on your resume would be what I would say. So I would say pick a, pick a path and then stick with that and be consistent uh, throughout both the resume and the portfolio in terms of how you present it. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that, I would say that, you know, I always recommend, generally speaking, before I answer specifically, generally speaking, talk about the objective, talk about the steps you took, and then talk about the outcome whether that's big picture or individual products, that's up to you, um, you know, but when you're talking about your portfolio, you only wanna really kind of highlight, and this is kind of general rule of thumb, you know, a few key pieces. What are you most proud of, right? So uh, is it important to outline each step of that process or the checkout process or whatever, whatever product that you're working on? Maybe, maybe it was really complicated, right? But if it wasn't, and you're just kind of speaking to it just to speak to, as another project, then that might not be as valuable as somebody. So really think hard about what do you want to highlight in this particular project and really try to narrow that down first and foremost before you jump into trying to talking about all of it. Yeah, I think what's funny is one way to think about it is, um, is, is your, your resume or portfolio is not a book report, it's more of like a marketing plan, right? Like you're not, you're not trying to just summarize everything that you did and show that you did all these different things. It really is how was the best way to present the most important and most valuable and most impressive things that I did at that job. And so, um, and, and trust me, whenever we talk, I'm assuming for everybody else, I know for myself, I'm absolutely speaking from experience of like that. Oh my God, I have to include this, but I, this was so important. I spent a year on this and it's so hard to like finally strike it from the resume or strike it from the portfolio. But that's the reality. After you go through a couple of presentations and people are like, all right, we got seven minutes show me your work and like, oh, sh okay, maybe I can't show you 50 things. So it doesn't matter. But if I could, if I had 10 minutes with somebody, what would be the most important things for them to know? If, so, if I know somebody is scanning this resume in a minute, what, are the, what did I really do with this job that would be the most important thing to know? And so I would say 
um, to the specific question around which projects, how to break it down, I would say summarize it and remember that you also have the portfolio. So figure out between your resume and the portfolio what's the, what's the most appropriate medium in order to go into more detail and in which detail to go into based off of what's most valuable um, from what you did the job. Oh, and one other thing, just to jump off of that, it depends on who you're sending that portfolio to, right? So if that stepped process and that product, to go back to that, you know, is important to that particular client because that's what they really need. They really need somebody who's experienced in uh, an e-commerce platform that's talking about, you know, shopping cart, then you should definitely highlight it, right? I mean, those are the things that you have to also take into consideration when thinking about your portfolio. Don't just, I mean, you can have a general portfolio, but I always recommend people to really kind of personalize it for each job that they're going after. So think about that and consider it as well. It's what's important to the person who's looking at it. Very cool. Um, got some questions about the, um, you know, under the umbrella that is UX, some of the more specific and maybe more novel aspects of it. So um, question from David about, do you see a bloom in, I love that term, bloom in a UX writing for your respective fields? Yes. Yes, we have. Um, it's, it's been um, probably over the last year, uh, we've seen a number of clients really see the value in uh, UX writing. And it, it started off as kind of a, for, for, for me anyways, as kind of a vague term, like what exactly do you mean by that? But as you kind of really start to uh, unravel it and understand it a little bit more, the differences that, you know, even a particular word on a button can make uh, to a particular process or a product can, can be exponential. Um, and it's, it's a matter of someone continuing on the process or falling off. So uh, understanding um, the users and understanding uh, you know, their emotions and, 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 and writing to that, it, it can be extremely impactful. Um, so it's been something that we've been seeing an increase for um, and more and more jobs around. Yeah, and to that end, um, when you do put work in your portfolio, this is a great opportunity not to use lorem ipsum text. Um, and, and I've seen a lot of this with designers and, and five years ago, 10 years ago, it was fine to put that in there. Um, but as we move more towards a content strategy centric UX practice, um, which is a mouthful, um, it becomes more and more important to actually pay attention to the words that are being used. Um, and I do know that um, folks that work for um, consulting agencies may have to scrub their work um, and take off, you know, um, things that might identify clients. Don't just put in words to put in words, you know, make sure that the words that you're putting in are, are understandable and make sense um, because those are going to be the things that a good hiring manager is going to look at. Um, so just make sure that, that those types of things are being taken, you know, you're looking at that with as much care as you are your wireframes and your visual designs and your imagery and all of those things that you're putting in there because all of that together creates the UX. So one like uh, zanier, wackier idea as well is a, a lot of um, like the company I worked at before, we did not, we wouldn't have known to look for a UX um, writer. Um, like that, that is just not something that would have come naturally to us, but we did know that we wanted to get a technical writer but really what we wanted was a UX writer to do this kind of writing for like a technical capacity. Um, so as you're looking for jobs, you may want to look for those that are, um, that, that are calling themselves tech writers as well um, and see if the general scope of the, of the role fits what you're looking to do in your career as well. Oh, we can go on a whole tangent about titles, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so, although we did touch on it. Um, what about for UX research, which is another sort of up and coming branch of UX or subset of UX? That is huge. Um, if you scan any uh, UX jobs now, you're going to see probably an increase tenfold of UX research jobs just in the last five years, um, which is wonderful because it means companies now are actually putting value on UX research. Um, and there's a lot of them out there, um, which is very cool. Um, if it's something that you love doing, um, I would still recommend that you have a place for your research that you've done in the past to live. Um, so it might not be the same as having a UX portfolio, um, but there are more and more companies now hiring specifically for that skill set. So if that's what you live and breathe and love, 
um, you know, get excited because there's lots of opportunities for that, especially at larger organizations that have the budget for it. We actually have, um, as you guys know, um, full-time UX researcher on my staff, Stephanie Pratt, who's amazing. Um, and what's cool about her is she spends 20, you know, she spends probably 25 hours a week just doing research you know, and analyzing research. And then she spends the other bit of time sharing out that research, understanding what product managers are trying to do with that research. So those types of jobs are becoming bigger and bigger and my company is small. And so we've invested in that heavily. Um, so if that's something you're passionate about doing, that is, there is definitely an area and a need for that for sure. Cool, all right, got an interesting question from Mark C. Uh, there's a couple of people who are asking multiple questions, which is totally allowed. Um, all right, so speaking of like language um, and speaking language to both recruiters and hiring managers, so what are your thoughts on potentially sending two resumes, one for one geared for a recruiter and one for a hiring manager? I'm curious to know if they mean directly or for the recruiter to pass along to the hiring manager. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there could be some value there, I guess. Um, you know, uh, for me, having kind of in that role, I, I would say that I, I want to see your best resume and I want to see your best resume for that particular job. Um, we kind of touched on this before where it's, you know, uh, are you the best match for this job? Does it speak to what the need is? Um, so in my mind, I, I'm not sure how you would go about having a better one for the manager rather than the recruiter, but there could be value there. I, I, I would just, as a recruiter myself, I, I wanna make sure that I see the best person for the job, I guess. I think this is an opportunity to really understand, um, <clears throat> you know, as Mauro said, like, what do you mean by how are you sending it? Like, it's, it's, it's really helpful to gain insight into kind of what it looks like on our end. We said we work with a, a um, an application called Lever. And so when it comes to me, they have an opportunity, you can take, I can download the real PDF of whatever was sent, but I can also do a parse version that comes out as just text. So in some cases, all of the, all of the effort that's put in won't even really make it through the, the machine of tools that might be part of the company's internal process. But I've also worked in places where it's kind of just an email to a person. And so I think um, if you kind of want to go what I'd consider more old school, where I've seen some really great things done where kind of that creative side where people are like mailing boxes to people that's an entire portfolio resume in one kind of thing, it would be great to say, listen, I have a package. Here's this is, and you put a couple of resumes, label one is for the hiring manager, label one is for the recruiter. That'd be awesome. But I think if you're thinking about having to apply for a job online through said um, you know, application process, it's probably gonna get lost in the shuffle and you might end up with it as a duplicate candidate. So I would probably recommend against it in that case. But if you have a connection and an opportunity to kind of directly send something to somebody, I think anything that can be considered creative and pretty interesting as an approach is always a good idea. So if you can figure out a way to sell it and make it seem extremely intentional and show that you also recognize kind of what their challenge is. Like, I know you don't wanna see all this detail. So I provided a different type of resume for you personally. Like that would be pretty cool to receive something like that. I'm like, oh my God, did this person tell it? Let me see what he did for you. Like it would cause a little frenzy inside the company because we would start to have conversations about you and before we even read your actual resume. So it could be absolutely cool. It's just a matter of, does it fit? Do you have the opportunity for it to actually land the way you want it to? A question from Kelly. So how much follow-up after the interview do you recommend? Uh, is it different in this time to allow uh, additional stress that would otherwise than it would otherwise? Excuse me. So, so just one perspective. I, I think like um, a quick follow up is useful to stay top of mind. Um, but I think like the old school rules about like business politeness and that kind of stuff are, at least for me, and maybe this is idiosyncratic just to me. I don't think they're particularly useful. Um, but like it does help if I've spoken with you that you shoot me a message just to like, you know, stay top of mind. Yeah, it never hurts just to send a quick thank you. Um, and then you could potentially use that to ask for next steps. Um, you could also send that two or three days later to, uh, to your point is to just stay on top of mind. Um, I mean, it's, it's just polite to do. Um, it takes two seconds to send an email. Um, 
so I, I never think that that's a bad thing. Yeah, just to echo that, I, I, I have a huge proponent of a follow-up thank you note, um, and not just uh, thank you for your time, but try to make a, a connection, right? So, hey, when we talked about X, Y, and Z in the interview, that really resonated with me, and I went home and did, you know, A, B, and C. Or take that, you know, opportunity to make one last connection with that hiring manager to try to have them remember you over somebody else. Um, and, uh, yeah, try to take that opportunity to kind of close the seal the deal. It's funny. I think what's great about panels is that people are going to express that they have different opinions about it. And I think that's kind of the point is that, especially as times continue to change, uh, there are some things that just folks will not break from, right? Where it's like, <laughs> even though it's, it's less of a thing today, and, and that might be absolutely accurate, you don't know who you're talk, sitting in front of, whether or not they're like, no, I am a traditionalist and this is, you're supposed to sit in this. I can't believe they didn't have a cup letter. That person might absolutely be that way. And I'm not, I'm not <laughs> judging anybody. <laughs> But it is, it, and because I, I fall myself, I, I find myself victim to that a little bit as well, where I don't typically um, put weight on them, but it's almost like I'll put negative if they don't come. It feels weird, like I'm not normally like amazed by the fact that somebody followed up, but it feels like something was missed if missed if they don't. And so I still have some of the well, this is how I learned and how I was taught and what I had to do. So by golly, you got to do it too. Like it just feels like it's a little bit a part of the process. So it's kind of that part where you have to recognize that. Who are you sitting in front of? And even if trends change, if times become more um, where it's not the norm, the hiring managers might not have changed. <laughs> people, people have not retired yet. <laughs> I'm really aging us all. Um, but you just don't know who you're sitting in front of. And so think about kind of what makes sense to you and what you feel most comfortable with. And, and, and I'd say stick to it. At, to that point, a handwritten note to me yeah, exactly. is, is getting that. You're like, wow, look, I got mail. <laughs> Right? And it's probably not as relevant these days as it, as it is, you know, even six months ago, getting something at the office. But, you know, uh, I would say that it's, from a traditional standpoint, uh, I'm, I'm with you, Charlie, getting something like that where somebody crafted something and put something together for you as a follow up, it, it really hits home. So, so I think it's, it's really nice to do. And, and as Jabali was saying, like it, it is um, a kind of a business norm. But, but I wonder, like, I'm actually curious, Emily, Jabali, Mauro, for your perspectives on this. Like, my mind is basically made up by the time I finished a phone, an interview. And so the follow-up is very unlikely to change my perspective about something. Um, so I'm like 98% sure about whether or not I want to continue talking to this person or not uh, at the end of the interview. So are you guys perceiving it as a the benefit is that it might nudge you like over the thresholds towards another engagement or are you more thinking it as it like this would be a disqualifier because now I think this person may not be a cultural fit or something like that. Uh, for me, I would say that there might be three or four candidates, you know, in, in the final running and uh, anything one person can do to differentiate themselves, I think is beneficial. Yep, that um, makes sense. Yeah. And I might have in my mind going, ah, that person, you know, is really great for it, but and then I receive something handcrafted from someone, you know, the next day. I don't know that uh, that can be the differentiator for me. It can be. Yep, makes and, sense. And and it's funny. That's why I said what I said because you're right. Nine times out of ten, not at all. I already know. Either we're hiring for multiple roles, so that person gets slotted as one of the people for the role, and it's like, no, we're good. I can keep going without having to make comparisons. It really is the the circumstance. And I, I'll give you a good example. Is like if there's a time where. Um, maybe the person that I know I like is is um, a little bit too expensive for the contract that we're hiring them for, or or they're asking for more than we would otherwise want to give. And we have somebody that we're kind of okay with that would otherwise fit all check all the boxes. I kind of want that person if I'm going to make that sale and commit to doing something that's a stretch, to have then checked all the necessary boxes where somebody came like, well, they didn't send the follow up. So are we going to are we going to push that hard to to stretch ourselves to hire them at a higher rate, knowing that. And it, that's a, like a minimal thing, but it's, I guess, as a candidate, I'm looking at it more from, I wouldn't want anything to possibly rule me out. So I would just take all steps um, necessary. But for me, honestly, no, you're right. Nine times out of 10, I know from the conversation and the follow-up doesn't, doesn't change it for me. I love it still feels special though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I disagree, but when they, they challenge each other, it makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> Um, speaking of, of trends, um, this is from Melanie Tim. So, how uh, are you seeing new roles that be are you're creating new roles? Do you see trends in um, how they're being created, rationalized to the business, formulated um, things like contract versus full time 
um, condensing multiple roles into one? Like what kind of trends when, when you, you see at your companies or at peers of um, new, new positions being created? I don't well, know. So go ahead, Emily. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I have seen, <laughs> um, I've seen both happen. I've seen companies push towards this crazy unicorn role, which drives me nuts because when you try and get a unicorn, you know, I want front end dev with wireframing and visual design and can write content uh, and knows Java. Uh, those make me crazy. Um, I but I have seen too. that, <laughs> I've seen that happen. Um, but I've also seen companies going, very much towards the specialization route, which is why I talked about UX research um, as being one of those, which is really uh, um, an interesting um, area that I'm so happy to see companies really highlighting now. The other thing that I've seen um, is companies looking for very specific skill sets, um, even with full-time employees. So uh, employees who know and can run and manage design systems, for instance, because that is a very different skill set in some ways than somebody that can come in and just do wireframes. Um, so I've seen a little bit of that too, where they're really trying to make almost this sort of hybrid role. And this is why I'm a big fan of um, people who have uh, different backgrounds um, who've done career changes is a lot of times you can tap into skills that you've gotten in one career and apply them to another career um, and design systems I'm using as an example. Um, but one of the things that design systems requires is a very high level of organization, um, a very high level of um, almost QA like detailed eyes um, and the ability to be able to understand how that system is going to influence the product direction and dev. So I've seen kind of both happening. Um, and what I tell people is generally gravitate towards the one that, you know, it has that um, kind of deep area that really resonates with you. If you like psychology and you like talking to people, then, you know, there are roles now for UX research and don't be afraid to go all in on that if that's what you really want to be doing. So that's what I tell people is really to kind of lean towards the things that get them excited. Um, it's still good, obviously, to be that T-shaped person. That's what we always want. But your DT might be something that's very different now than it was five years ago. And content, you know, writing is one, research is one. Um, and then these sort of kind of germane areas, like I said, like design system, design and management is another one. And the reason I started off with that big, I don't know is because <laughs> <laughs> like in these situations, I really would say read the job description, the titles and the stuff that I've seen people do, the reasons why, like it is kind of like pulling behind the curtain. It's so crazy. The things that like the, the <laughs> business development team will come, come to me with and say like, look, we got we to staff for these roles on this contract. They're calling it a, um, a content architect and, and they need the person to know how to do, they, they, have, they just have words in here, InDesign, Java, it, familiarity <laughs> with AWS. And it's like, it's all over the place. And so then we have to put something out that matches some version of that set of requirements. And so sometimes this whole combining of skills and, and making up new ones or, or figuring out ways to reword it is actually based off of some other pressure that's taken place. And so even internally right now, I'm getting very big on like, Let's not use the term. I don't want to use UX. I don't want to use UI. Tell me what you need. I need somebody to improve the aesthetic of my project. Tell me what you need me to do. <laughs> like just describe it without using the word, the, the word in the definition. Like that's what I need from people. So, so I think with that, even just knowing that, yes, I've seen the trends come. I've seen um, even literally throughout the month to month, throughout the year, new titles kind of emerge. And a lot of times if you ask people, what does it really mean? It's probably an old title that you've heard of or a combination of two. So I wouldn't necessarily career chase based off of those different de um, descriptions. I would just continue to focus on building whatever skill sets I think make the most sense for me to be good at what I'm doing mm -hmm. and recognize that throughout that time, you might be applying for a job and be like, I don't even know what this thing is. That's my first UX job was. I was a creative director and I was doing website design and development. And I sat down with people and I was like, oh, I do that stuff, but I don't know what UX means. So it happens. And I, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be either overly excited by it because it'll go away in six months or uh, scared of a title if you see one that you don't feel like fits your, your skill set. Yeah, I would say that although it's probably extremely frustrating for people applying for a UX designer job uh, where the, you know, the job description doesn't necessarily match this, you know, the, the need, like you know, to Jibali's point, I would say it's a good sign, though, that companies and digital departments are starting to mature. They're, uh, you know, looking to 
looking for help and they, they're not quite sure where or how it kind of fits into their organization. But as they're looking to scale those departments, you know, some might only have one UX designer that has to do some research and some UX design and some UI and some content writing and things like that. But as they're looking to grow, they start to get specialized and they're starting to do design systems and they're looking for people to set up centers of excellence, you know, at, with their client. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of pushing back and to that salesperson who sold like a business analyst to be a UX designer, right? Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think it's a good sign overall for the industry because um, they're actually asking for it now. And, you know, it's not something that you're having to sell, um, but it, it'll, it'll, it'll continue to uh, refine itself and, you know, might be something else and to your point in six months, so. Yeah, Mara, I totally agree with you. Um, I, th I think I'm, I'm guilty of like basically everything that Emily was worried about, <laughs> like looking for this sort of unicorn. Um, I think I'm uh, especially guilty of that right now with the roles we're trying to hire because we're so tiny, right? We're only 25 people and um, we're not likely to be able to hire a full creative team right now. All right, I don't mean to traumatize Jabali. He's obviously seen some things, but I'm going to put one more nail in this title thing because we have a question about it. So, um, dedicated UX designers or the UX UI combination job title when you're searching. I get the viewpoint of like, I just want the best person, but if you're looking for roles to apply to or to base off of uh, any insight into why the combo or if you're looking for a dedicated UX designer. Yeah, well, it's, it's, one or the other. No, it's, it's funny. That's why I say it, 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 it so much depends and you really, um, it, I, we've literally submitted stuff where we're talking about the same person in the role, the way we name the role is based off of somebody else wrote it because it was for a dedicated contract. And so literally it might not mean anything like it might not go. I wouldn't even read all the way necessarily too much into it. UX UI might absolutely mean product designer might actually mean UX designer to the same company. And you could see different recs go out if the company is large enough because it can come from different parts of the company. And I know that sounds, that seems crazy and sounds confusing. But that's why I say, look at the details of the description. Um, but in general, um, even in that situation, um, what, I, what we try to do, I'll give you an example. We were hiring like six UXers uh, earlier this year for a large contract and really they had a, the same specific crazy needs AWS requirements kind of thing in the job description. But I worked with the UX lead on that project and we were trying to build a team. And so the, for the job description will look the same for each person, but we knew we wanted somebody more race, um, research based. We needed somebody who was more senior, more junior, more, more visual, more like uh, somebody that could do a little bit of, of both. And so we were actually building a team. And even though the wreck of the job description looked the same to the people on the outside, as we were bringing in candidates, we knew that we were still going to hire two visual, two research and two craft mixes. We were looking for a senior and, and maybe two junior. Like we, we had a whole plan. And none of that was necessarily going to be reflected in what you read in a job description. Sorry, Troy and Gary, that's a, I meant, forgot to mention your names there. Okay. Um, let's do a couple more. We have about six minutes left. So thank you, Abby, for the, the link there for the nice little plug. Good job. <laughs> Do you want to take a, a second to talk about what, um, in case people do need to drop off exactly at 7.30, what, what you're looking for? I don't want to hog people's time on this, but it, um, we're looking for a product designer. We're really early stage, right, post series A. And so we just need someone to help us um, improve uh, the design by implementing a design system. Because um, uh, you know, most of what we would design has been done by UI UX engineers, not by a fully dedicated UX designer. Um, and so that's really what we're looking for the most help with right now. Um, so there's a couple of different roles that are on there um, listed right now. So take a look. And if you have any questions, either apply there and let me know or just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, love to chat with more people about this. Cool. And just so everyone on the call knows, I, um, I will do another share screen and I have these lovely four faces with their contact, um, their preferred contact information at the bottom there so, uh, so that you can have that. I will throw that up in a second. Uh, I think we have like a couple more questions, um, so I'll keep going until we hit 7:30. Um, so about down selecting from mostly from like a recruiter shortlisting, sorry, shortlisting candidates um, from the initial phone screen. Uh, hiring, hiring managers and recruiters may have differences in what they're looking for and differences in understanding. So how, um, in your experience, how do 
candidates get shortlisted from, from the, for the initial uh, phone screen. And this is from Addie. Yeah, I guess I'll go first on this one. For me, um, and I kind of mentioned this before, it's really understanding the job description and do you have on paper what it what we need, right? I mean, it's really, um, am I seeing what will make a successful candidate in this role? Um, and if, if, if you show me that on paper, then I'm gonna stop and look and go a little bit deeper. Um, so for the, that initial touch point, it's so crucial to really, really dig deep into that job description and, and compo compose your experience, bubble it to the top, think about how you're writing the resume, how it's gonna uh, resonate and echo with me as the recruiter that's looking at the resume. Um, and if it does, then you know, you're gonna make it the next step for sure. Yeah, and I, I think something interesting, um, <clears throat> again, sort of the behind the curtain piece is that like the, I would have a recruiter and even when I don't, um, I would be the director of the recruiting team that I have a, a immediately established a, a relationship with. And so when we're going after a role, first person they send me, send me a, a group of people. I'm like, no, nah, none of these are it. We're going to have a meeting and talk about what they're seeing, what I'm seeing that they're not and why we're not in line with whatever their screen is, why they're not making it through my screen. And so even in places where we might differ and it might be a kind of a different initial um, screen, ultimately it kind of is still, it's, it's kind of expected to be my decision where they feel like they're having, they're giving me candidates that they're going to be viable enough for me to actually consider and want to eventually hire. And that's their goal. And so whatever that means they need to do to educate themselves quickly to say, okay, well, which words are you looking for for this? What are the buzzwords I should be listening for? What are the skill sets? What kind of years? What kind of personality type? They're going to ask me those questions um, and continue to ask them as we, they're looking at candidates to make sure that we're going to kind of get closer to it. And so it's interesting because I know people talked about the idea of tailoring resumes. In some of my experience, um, I've actually seen the um, recruiter be a little bit um, listening, listen more for kind of the technical terms. I don't, because I don't know, like I can hear without you saying it kind of what you really did. If, if I'm not an expert in the field though, I might just know I need to hear you say envision. I, if they keep telling me that you needed to do wireframing. I'm not sure if wireframing is the same as if you use the word, if you use some other tool to describe your wireframe, but whenever it's a wireframing, a recruiter might not pick up on that. So you might actually want to be detailed and use all the technical terms for things because they've done kind of enough homework to say, I'm looking for seven buzzwords. And if I hear those, I kind of can pick up on uh, what that means to um, whether or not it hits the mark. And sometimes it's wrong, but sometimes uh, that's just how it goes. So I would say recognize that we do develop a relationship and it's not like two separate conversations. Typically, we put genuine effort into trying to be aligned around what we're looking for. And when things are not um, a match, we will have conversations to, to kind of re-baseline so that we should hopefully be listening for the same types of things. And I would give one more piece of advice um, that I've seen. Keep track of who you're applying to, uh, whether that's a spreadsheet, um, a Google Doc, whatever it is. Keep track of where you've applied, who you've talked to, what stage you're at in that process. Um, because I cannot tell you how many times I've gotten multiple copies of the same resume from the same person over the course of like three or four days because they are blanketing every job site they possibly can with their resume. And so um, I get like three or four different ones because I'll get it from ZipRecruiter, from LinkedIn, from our own internal company tool. Um, and then um, if I reach out to them, they'll forget who I am. They'll forget that we've had a conversation. So like whatever you do, make sure that you're staying really organized with that because there's no quicker way to turn off a hiring manager than to confuse them with somebody else or not know where you're at in the process or, so just keep track of what you've done, where you've applied to, um, because, because we usually we can tell if, you, if you're not. <laughs> yeah, oh man. It's, and then plus on the other side, you know, it's, it's, it's annoying when someone forgets that you had a conversation even on the candidate side. So it works the same way, right? People are people. Yeah, and cheap notes. I mean, right now we're all on Zoom, so like, I don't have a problem if somebody's taking notes while we're having a conversation um, because it means they're paying attention. Um, but you have the ability now to be able to keep track of all those things and to keep that, that notepad of, of whatever you're hearing. So 
um, to the extent that you can do that without getting completely like distracted, uh, do that just so that you can keep people separate. Because I do know that when you're applying to multiple jobs, it's very easy for those things to start to overlap. Um, and that's honestly where like literally like five or 10 minutes, even when you're done, if you don't want to do it while you're doing the interview, when you're finished, take five minutes and just debrief and write down some of the things that you remember from that interview. Um, so that if we have a conversation the next time, those things will come back up again. Um, this is what I do with candidates. It's really important. I might be interviewing five candidates in a day. Um, so it's just as important for me to do that as it is for you to do that. Yeah, have a strategy. I mean, that's why I kept trying to hone in on that, that resume piece. But really, I mean, be organized for sure. Uh, take it serious. It, don't just blank it because blank it's yeah. not a strategy, right? I mean, make a connection with that resume. Take that opportunity to really try to get that through the... Um, you know, through the hiring process. Take some yep. time to understand what you're applying to. Yep. Okay, so um, I know we're a little over time, so apologize for one minute. Um, and I know I didn't get to all the questions. I think someone messaged me privately, but I didn't quite see it because I am not moderating and hosting. Sorry about that, I think it was Sarah. Um, so I couldn't quite get what you were saying, but uh, any final advice for the crowd here before, um, since we're like at slash over time. And then also there's contact information in case you guys have specific questions for these individuals. So panelists, final thoughts? I would say don't give up, have patience. Um, it is, it, we all need a little bit more of it right now. Um, things are gonna move a little bit slower, but um, the jobs are coming back online. Um, companies are starting to hire again. Um, so if you have a setback, don't let that derail everything else. I think there's an old saying that says a setback is a setup for a comeback. Um, so just keep forging ahead and keep staying positive. Yeah. And then keep in mind that a lot of the like interviews, if they don't go well, it's, or if your resume doesn't get replied to, it's so exactly. idiosyncratic. Um, like it's, it's, you know, maybe I was in a bad mood that day, or maybe I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like not hiring on the right, um, criteria. So yeah. Don't take it too personally, um, but stay um, stay active and keep trying. That's a great industry to be a part of right now. Uh, it's only going to get bigger and better. Um, hiring managers are going to get you know um, more mature, more educated on their needs and the job descriptions, uh, which is only going to help the candidates. So uh, these next couple of months uh, might be slow going, but it's it's coming. It's going to come come back pretty fast. I'm, I'm sure of it. Yeah, and I, I'd say um, use this time to be a content creator. Just look for look for where are the opportunities to to capture thoughts, to to put pieces of, of work together, and just to with so many. The, the, one of the crazy things, I guess, is like a comedian, and maybe creatives, is like when when crazy things are going on in the world, there's opportunities for you to really come up with a lot of content. And so, one of the places where you can put your passion um, to use and, and really really flex the ways in which you might capture thought around or or look for solutions for or anything of that nature um as you're sitting in during this time where there's probably a lot of new situations people are going through and new problems create new opportunities to to, to recommend solutions so to sort of create content look for opportunities to leverage this new wonderful world of social media and everything that we have to to kind of just be a voice Cool. Um, thank you again so much for all of our panelists for taking time out of your evening and for uh, sharing your insights and your thoughts and being willing to be put on the spot um, and agreeing to be recorded at the very last minute. That was something maybe we should have planned. So, you know, lessons learned. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Thank you for everyone who joined and for asked questions. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. If uh, there's also UXPA and we're the same thing, it's different we're sorting it out, just put it that way. UXPA, DC and DCUX, we're kind of the same group. Um, those are, those contact is also up there on that screen as well. So feel free to reach out to us if you like this type of session, if you wanna see more of this kind, um, advice for other kinds, any sort of feedback, we're open to it because we're here to serve you all. So thank you. I'm gonna keep the line open in case people wanna chat with each other. Um, rules, rules are off now that we're over time. So if you wanna go unmuted and, and chat with each other, our panelists want to hang out and stay. They need to go. Um, this is just kind of a, I'm like unleashing all the rules now. So <laughs> free for all like virtual networking session if you'd like. Otherwise, wonderful evening and have a, have a good rest of your week, everyone.
Thanks, Thanks Asha. Thanks Thank you, Asha. Thank you all. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.